very quickly then, let's talk about the, um, the, the sequence of events in the interview. How do you actually run an interview? You know, assuming this is a kind of face-to-face -face interview, generally unstructured, what goes on? Well, first of all, there's an introductory period. You introduce yourself. You establish a relationship with the interviewee. Um, you tell them who you are, what your background is. You go through the ethics of the situation. So if there's an ethics form to sign, you get them to sign that, read through their rights and so on, you know, you know the, their, their ability to stop at any time and all that kind of stuff. And explain the aim of what you're doing. Now, you don't give away the whole game, but you give a context to them that helps them orientate their thoughts towards the topic you're going to be talking about. Um, Oh, sorry, I've said that in the second one about confidentiality and so on. Um, again, part of the ethics of, of uh, interviewing is confidentiality. If people, people don't always want that. Some people are quite happy not to be anonymous and so on, uh, particularly politicians and so on, are quite happy to have their names used. Um, but uh, most people would, would, would you know, expect to be, you know, their details be kept anonymous. And sometimes that's very important. If it's any, any kind of contentious area that might affect people and their jobs, then you need to, to keep them anonymous and keep the data confidential. Then you start with a set of, of introductory issues. So you, you start asking questions. And normally you have some kind of warm up, some simple questions. Notice on the, um, the, the first interview schedule on this example here, the, the history of education and employment. That's pretty simple. You just simply say, what happened? What have you done? And people can, can answer those, those straightforward factual questions fairly easily. That gets them relaxed. It, it enables you to begin to establish a rapport a kind of feeling of mutual trust between you and the interviewee as you go through. So very often you start with these relatively easy to answer questions, the, the factual ones. Then you move into your main body of the interview, the, the shopping list, that's the, the, this kind of schedule of things you want to find out about, and go through and, and, and basically get people to talk to each of the topics that you've got there. Go through your shopping list. That's the bulk of the interview. That can last for an hour or more, doing that. Then you come to the, the ending questions, the cooling off questions. Finish perhaps on uncontentious areas, areas you've agreed upon, or perhaps recap certain things that you've covered before, things that are easier to deal with. Give people a sense that you're coming towards the end, if you possibly can. Uh, give them a chance to, to kind of wind down from what often is a very intense kind of, of activity, the, the interview. Um, then there's the closure. Then, obviously, you've, you've got a signal. You're the interviewee. You're, sorry, the interviewer. You're in charge. So you've got a signal that now things have come to an end. Thank you very much. That's really helpful. Um, and um, you, um, you, know, you, you, you kind of make sure that, that you've got all your things signed. If you need to have your um, um, informed consent form signed, you make sure that's done, etc. And the interview comes to an end. You turn off the tape recorder. Um, I'm assuming you're recording it in some way or your digital recorder. Um, and then, quite typically, the interview carries on. Um, so there's a signal. There's a physical signal from you saying it's finished and the turning off of the machinery, the packing away of things, taking your notepad and putting it back into your, your, your bag and so on. All those kind of things are physical signs it's finished. And usually then the interview carries on. The person has been talking to you for an hour or more, um, and they're going to carry on talking. They might talk about other things, but very often they'll come back to things that they've talked about earlier on in the interview. Um, and in some sense, therefore, the interview is carrying on. There's no reason why you can't use that information. In a research interview, there's no off the record as such. There's no distinction between on the record and off the record. A research interview is a research interview. You deal with it ethically by you know, all sorts of issues to do with anonymity and con uh, confidentiality and so on, very differently from media interview. So there is no off the record. Anything they say to you, even after the interview has, has apparently finished, is still part of the research interview. Um, and often the interview becomes more relaxed at that stage. I mean, typically, if, if you've gone to someone's house, they'll say, do you want a cup of tea then, or something like that, before you go. Um, and they'll tell you one or two other things. Uh, it might just be on the, on, the, on the way, you know, just things that they come to mind at that stage, uncontentious, but more information. That's useful. Um, you can, if you want to, then get out your notepad and write things down and jot that down so they know you're taking a record. Um, but sometimes they go back to talk about more contentious things they, they wouldn't say earlier on. They now feel more relaxed and more at ease, and so they tell you those things. 
Still confidential, of course. Still, you have to protect anonymity. Um, but helpful asides that help your research. And then it's your job then to remember those things. I know a friend of mine who did a lot of interviews some years ago said that he got used to the fact that he turned off the tape recorder, have a cup of tea with the person, leave the house. When he got back into his car, he'd sit in the car with it, got the notepad out straight away and jot down all the other things that had been said to him over the cup of tea that were relevant to his interview. Sometimes quite uncontentious, but more detail that was coming out. So that's the, the, the end of the session. At this point of, of the, the types of questions, so the different ways in which you can ask questions and ask things in interviews, different things you can ask about, really. Um, now, the obvious ones are, are the first thing, the factual questions. What did you, what did you do? What, what have you done? Where did you do it? What jobs have you done? Where were you born? Where did you live? How old are you? Those you know, simple factual things you can ask about. Sometimes with a lot of detail, you know, um, you know, tell me about being a student. What did you do? Where did you live? You know, what did you study? How many years, etc. There's lots of it. You can talk a long period about you know, a three-year degree um, and, and the period you've spent doing that. So there can be lots of detail, but they're all pretty simple factual questions. What was happening? What was done? And so on. You can also ask questions which you might, you might say are structural questions. Questions about how the person organises their knowledge. Here you're coming to issues about categorisation, typologies and so on, the different ways and distinctions that people make between things. And you might you know, actually ask a direct question about it, but more often it'll be through various kinds of probing, um, asking questions that get people to elaborate more and more exactly how they see things and how they distinguish things. So... Um, Maybe let's just think of an example. Um, when you chose to go to university, how did you choose which university to go to? Okay, so what different kinds of universities are there? How did you distinguish one university from another? Did you categorise them? Why did you think some were like this, some were like Why did you choose those rather than others? What you're getting to now is a whole set of ways in which people categorise and uh, uh, typify you know, universities that they might have gone to or chosen. So it's how they're using the category of, of this kind of university, that kind of university, and so on, and the way they choose to do that. So that's one, just one example of the kind of structural information you're trying to get to in an interview. Another thing you can do is that the contrast um, uh, um, questions. Um, in particular, asking them about situations, experiences, and, and episodes of their life by way of contrast with others. And here's a particular way you can ask about it. It's not just what happened to you when, you know, um, back to the, the, the going to university thing. You might say, okay, when you went to so-and-so for your interview or your open day or whatever, what happened? They give the answer. So that's a fairly factual question. It's, it's type one. It's factual, right? That's what they did. That's what they said. But then you can get to a, a contrast situation. Where, okay, so how was that different from the other one? How was that different from a second one you went to, where you went to their open day, different university? How did they, how were they, they were the same? How were they different? And in particular, you might ask them what they thought about it, what they felt about it. What did it mean to them? And you're getting much more of a set of, of contrast coming out. So you're asking, in this case, not just factual things, but also getting to other things to do with their experience of it, their, their feelings about it, and what it meant to them, and so on. But doing it by way of contrast, asking them how it was different or the same. And that's a, a, a very an easy way for people to, to answer questions about meaning and interpretation and feeling. Um, if you just simply ask them, the open question, okay, how do you feel? What did you feel about your first visit to university? That's very hard to answer that. But if you ask them to contrast, how was that different from that one? What did you feel about that as opposed to that one? People find it much easier to answer those kinds of deeper questions about contrast. So contrast is a very good way of getting to those kinds of issues. Okay, another thing you can ask about or you can, uh, you can do is what's called the generative question. And this, I've already talked about this very briefly when I mentioned the narrative interview. This is the kind of question that sets people up for a very long answer. And here's Herman's take on that. Herman suggests the interviewer's task 
is to make the informant tell the story of the area of interest in question as a consistent story of all relevant events from beginning to end. So you kind of, it may take you several sentences to explain this to the person. What you want them to do is to tell the story of and give us all the details you can, explain what happened and how it went through and so on. And if you do it right, people can then set off with an answer that might take them half an hour or an hour to tell you. So that the very good generative question starts off a long explanation, which includes all kinds of elements that you want and interested in about, about how they conceptualise things, about what they did and what feelings and, and interpretations and, uh, they have about those situations. Now, as said below, it's normally deployed in the life history or the narrative approach. A typical narrative interview tries to start with such a question. It may take a few, a few seconds to get going. You may, may start with something and they say, well, I'm not quite sure what you want here. Well, you know, start with so-and-so and go on to this and that, you know. Or, and it may take a, a few minutes to get going, but eventually, if you do it well, the person starts to narrate their life or narrate the events around that particular aspect of their life that you're interested in. Um, so the, the important point about it is to, to formulate it fairly broadly. It's open-ended um, and it's broad, but it, it has to specify the domain of interest that you want. So either it's their life or it's this aspect of it. When you did so-and-so, you know, when you went to work um, overseas on, on your um, volunteer um, uh, job, what happened? Tell, tell me about the experience of, of volunteering overseas. What happened then? It might have been over several years that they did it, so they've got a long story to tell about all the events that led up to it and then happened and then how they came back. So you're specifying you know, the, in broad terms but limiting to the area of interest to you. Don't interrupt. I mean, ideally, this type of questioning should be the respondent telling you and you don't need to interrupt them. So you certainly don't stop them. Let them carry on. Let them have pauses too. Let them think through things. Wait for them to come back and say more. So you, as the editor, have to empathise, reinforce, try to understand, and try not to interrupt too much. Even if you don't understand something, come back to that later. Jot it down to come back to later. Don't interrupt their flow of things. And when they're finished, then you've got a chance to come back. You can ask more direct questions explanations and so on, filling in gaps, etc., which might lead to another long story, of course, um, again. Okay, so there's some, some types of questions you can ask. Another way of looking at this is um, something that Berg comes up with, Berg's four styles of questions. Um, another way, of, of another take on a different way you can ask in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a particularly unstructured interview. Berg has what he calls the essential questions, concerned with the central focus of the study, the things you want to find out about. Um, and you can place them together at the beginning or all the way, sprinkle them through. But anyway, the things you, re you really must know about, that you know you've got to ask about or find out about. There may be extra questions that come with that, particularly ones that are generated by the discussion, by the, the conversation you're having with the respondent. Um, you know, you, you, they may, they're obviously related to the essential issues, but they may come out as, as extra spin or extra details on, on those things as it comes out from your conversation. Things you haven't thought about beforehand, perhaps, that are now obvious when they, you've got a reply from the respondent. Then there are other types of things you can say, which are, uh, Berg calls the throwaway questions or the throwaway comments, which are used to develop rapport. Now, this is an important thing. Rapport means a kind of feeling of mutual engagement between you and the respondent to get the job done, to find out about the things. With rapport, the respondent becomes much more open to you. Um, you feel you're getting what you want from the interview. You're happy about it as well. But it's a kind of feeling of ease between you and the respondent about what's happening and what's going on, what information you're giving. And that's what you're trying to get to, a feeling of mutual trust and mutual ease between you. Uh, and you can often do that with these kinds of extra throwaway comments and questions. Um, one way of doing this is the demographics of being, you know, who are you, what are you, where are you from, tell me a bit about your life, that kind of thing, that's setting things up and getting things going. Um, and also the cooling off questions at the end can be part of this rapport as well. Um, but there can be questions, you know, in the middle of the interview as well that are doing that, to reinforcing. Now, the danger here with these kinds of questions is the reinforcements you give reinforce the person's opinions. You don't want that. 
Um, you want to remain, as, as, you, as far as you can, fairly neutral. If they're coming out with a particular view on things, a particular view that you might dislike it or you may agree with it, it doesn't really matter either way, but you shouldn't be in there as an interviewer coming in and agreeing with them. You should be indicating them merely that you're listening, merely that, in a sense, when you say to somebody, that's right, what you mean is not you agree with their view. What you're saying by that's right is, I'm listening to you, you are telling me the kind of things I want to hear about. So as an interviewer, the reinforcements that you give, the throwaway comments that establishing rapport are about this is going the right way for my research. We're doing the right things here, you're giving me the right information that I need, not I agree with your opinions, I agree with your views about that, or I disagree even with your views about that, either way. That's not the job of the interviewer. So establishing rapport is not agreeing with opinions, it is a, a sense of, of a mutual engagement on an activity that is, that is useful and is what's wanted. And that's, that's a very diff difficult distinction to make sometimes, very difficult to do actually at, at the time. But you've got to try not to agree with opinions, but to try and get rapport uh, agreement about the exercise itself. And the fourth kind of point that uh, Berg brings up is this prompts. I mentioned this several times now, the, the idea of prompts. But the point about an interview is that you can use the occasion to find out more detail. If the person hasn't said enough, hasn't given you what you need, uh, you can ask more about it. And that's what prompting or probing is about. It's getting more from people. Um, a means of drawing out more complete records. Or asking for elaboration. Mean, the simplest is asking for elaboration. You simply say, someone gives you a thing, tells you something, I did so and so. And then you ask, OK, so could you tell me more about that? That just simply sells them to, to give more detail. Or what happened next? Or did it? Or how, how come? Those kinds of, of ask for more detail kind of questions. That, that's a very common probe, a very common prompt. You can also use them in order of imperativeness as well if you want to. If the person isn't really telling you the right things, you can, you can push it in various ways. Now, the simplest of these is the expectant glance. You simply you know, you use eye contact to indicate, yeah, carry on. That's all it says. And we're, we're so used to doing this, we don't think much about it. But you have to think to yourself, OK, I want to know more. You just simply look at them, you perhaps raise your eyebrows, and you look at them directly. And that says, I want to hear more. And they will then carry on talking. That's, that's often enough. But sometimes it isn't. Sometimes you need a bit, a bit more. You might um, and, and, and you might say, mm, yes, yes, and those kind of things. Nod your head a bit. Um, you know, expectant glances and so on to tell people you're doing the right things just carry on carry on that's right yes I, that's good stuff you're saying that's the kind of indication you're giving very kind of passive kind of prompts but sometimes you need to say something and that's when the what else kind of questions or these the ones i said above the tell me more or what ne happened next that kind of thing come in so direct questions ideally you want to avoid saying too much so the other prompts are the things to use but if if you have to then you can ask direct questions of people particularly to get more information. People might not be let so, so forthcoming even then, so you need to, to up the ante a bit, to you know, start. What other reasons? What else is going on here? What, what else can you say about it? Um, what else happened? So you ask much more direct questions now. And you can even get quite forceful about it. Please tell me more about that. You know, if the person is, is you know, kind of finished very quickly or, or not giving you the detail you need, you know, push it and say, well, I, I need to know more about that. What's going on here? Be sensitive, of course, to their feelings. There may be good reasons why they're not telling you more about what's happening. So you've got to be aware of that and perhaps work around it or reassure people that it is you know, perfectly legitimate to talk about these things and say these things. So be sensitive to that. But at the same time, you may have to be pretty forceful. And the most forceful, perhaps, is I'm interested in all your reasons. So it's, it's, you know, it doesn't matter what you say. I, I, it, all the kind of things are, are interesting here. Um, don't, don't um, you know... Don't, don't hold back. And you might say you're reserving this for the most evasive respondents of all. But, but you can up the ante in the sense of, of, of the probing from the very kind of passive almost uh, just glances right the way through to a quite forceful, yeah, give me more. Tell me more about that. That's really interesting. I really want to know about that. And so not just that, but what else going, going on here and so on. And push it. And that's your responsibility as interviewer to do that in an appropriate way 
not, in, not upsetting the person. You're not, you're not a, an interrogator here. You're not, you're not um, you know, trying to find, you're not uh, you know, interrogating a spy or anything like that. It is a, 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 a research interview, so you mustn't upset the people. But on the other hand, you can make it clear that other things you know, are important to this interview.